So I'm going to go ahead and get started with the talk. And I, um, many of you know, who saw the email that the theme for this evening is cultivating compassion for the journey. And so I wanted to put this in the perspective of cultivating compassion for the journey, because sometimes I think we have a very limited understanding of compassion. And that compassion is just that sort of natural quality of the heart that arises in response to a certain scenario or a situation. But I really wanna use the framework and the process tonight to see that we can actually cultivate compassion ahead of time, that we can have it just be a part of this capacity that we have of the heart to meet whatever arises, all those situations that we can't plan for but we can actually cultivate this capacity in our heart, not both, also, both for ourselves individually and for the challenges that we meet in society. So to start off, I just wanna give you a definition of compassion, that compassion is described as the feeling of sorrow or a deep tenderness for one who is suffering or experiencing some sort of obstacle or misfortune. So this is that sense of this deep feeling that we have that resonates when there's suffering that happens. And it's different from love. And as I mentioned in the, um, in the meditation, one of the expressions has said that compassion is like the quivering of the heart in response to suffering. And then there's thought to be sort of a response from there so that there's a response is evoked. And so one meditation teacher gave this distinction between sort of love and compassion. And she said that love is like, you know, just holding your hand in your heart, you know, you love and compassion is like reaching your hand, reaching out to support another. So the love is the feeling and then compassion is just like, oh, it's that caring that you, you feel our relational field. And so it's this tenderness and this inclination to care. It's a, so it's a response, it's a relational response. And I don't know about you, but in society, you know, there's a certain level of care and responsiveness that, that we're taught, but there's generally an underlying or overarching message that we better look out for ourselves you know, no one else is going to take care of you and you better just make sure, <clears throat> you know, put yourself first and get what you need and kind of just keep going there. And that sense of compassion might just be a little soft. If you try, you know, are a little bit too caring, you're just going to be a doormat. You know, everyone's going to be taking all your things and you'll be left destitute. You know, that sense of like, you'll give it all away. And I find that a rather limited view because compassion really invites us into this sense that we are already interdependent, that we are inter interdependently connected in this mutual network, that there really isn't, you know, like, like this sense of like, I'm going to get this for me and you over there that we really are connected in this world and that we have to remember the causes and effects of our actions and how they impact each other. And just for a different perspective than, you know, sort of this doggy dog world, the Dalai Lama says, love and compassion are necessities, not luxuries. Without them, humanity cannot survive. So rather than, you know, the necessities be get as much as you can as quickly as you can, the Dalai Lama is sort of flipping that and saying, what if we were to focus on love and compassion as the necessities so that our humanity can survive? And I love that focus because to me, it really flips this sense of like survival being dependent not on getting what I'm getting or obtaining, but on this development of the heart. And so this invitation is to include compassion as part of the journey, 
as an intentional practice, more than just a once in a while thing of like, oh, maybe I'll help here or I'll help there, but to really cultivate this tenderness. And I really love this word tenderness because it has so many different meetings. So it evokes to me this idea of like the garden and the way, you know, when you have a garden throughout all the seasons, you tend the garden, especially here in California where we can garden year round. But even for my sister who lives in Vermont, you know, she, you cultivate the soil and then you plant the seeds and then you're pulling the weeds and then you're throughout the year, you're doing, you're tending the garden, you know, and so this is our, the gardens of our heart that we're tending throughout the year in different ways. And so I wanted to bring in some aspects of compassion, both looking at self-compassion and more of the relational field of compassion. And um, some of you may be familiar with Dr. Kristen Neff, who has become very well known and she was the first uh, person, one of the first people to study self-compassion. And she's a researcher, author, psychology professor. professor. And, um, and I really appreciate her work because she took this place of like, oh, if you study, if you focus on self-compassion, you're gonna be self-indulgent, you know, you're gonna, it's all gonna be about me, 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 me. And really began to say that actually, as we look at our own hearts, and minds, we are more able to have the capacity to be with others' hearts and minds. And if we're shut down from our own self compassion, then it's sometimes hard to feel compassion for others. So I wanted to share three ways that she says that we can develop this self compassion. And so I'll just mention the three of them and then go into each, each of them a little bit more. And so she says the first one is self kindness rather than self-judgment. So self-kindness rather than self-judgment. And the second one is a sense of a common humanity instead of feeling isolated. And then the third one, which many of you will be familiar with because practicing mindfulness, but to engage the sense of mindfulness of what's happening rather than identifying, over-identifying with like, oh, I, you know, that mindfulness can help us to see that it's not just me. So I'm just gonna explore each one of these a little bit to share how it can support us in this capacity to care and to be in community with others. So this first one of self-kindness versus self-judgment invites us to look at the habit patterns of our mind based on judging. So I don't know about you, but I grew up in a family that was very much about getting ahead and improving yourself, you know, success and, Whatever I did, I was supposed to always be moving forward. And society often, you know, has us doing that. It's as if we're one of those corporate growth charts that always goes up. You know, we never fail in anybody in any business or any aspect of our life. We know there are ups and downs. And so we can't always have an upward trend. And yet when we do something, instead of being like, oh, that's the causes and conditions of what's happening, we tend to go into self-judgment and blame and shame. And so if we can begin to see that this is just the pattern of our life, that sometimes we'll, things will be going well and sometimes they won't, and then offer ourselves care. All of us right now are in this global pandemic in a place of great economic uncertainty. Many of us have experienced friends who are ill, friends who have died, and the regular, and I just say regular, the regular problems have all become even greater within the constructs of the current scenario. And so sometimes we're like, I should, I, why am I not, you know, why am I not meeting this moment? But then I can remember, wow, there's this and this and this and this, and be just like that. Oh, right. Can I bring some sense of kindness to myself? And if I can pause and offer that kindness, I can develop a little more capacity to hold and weather all of these causes and conditions. And at the same time, compassion 
is not like this is a quote from Pema Chodron, who many of you know is a, a, a Buddhist nun in the Shambhala tradition. And she says, compassion isn't some kind of self-improvement project or ideal that we're trying to live up to. Having compassion starts and ends with having compassion for all those unwanted parts of ourselves, all those imperfections that we don't even want to look at. And that's by Pema Chodron. And I really like that because, you know, like I can have compassion when I do this, but like there are parts of myself that I'm just like, haven't I dealt with that yet? Why am I not over that? And just to kind of remember that kindness to meet that and that adding in the judging is actually not going to be the solution to kind of holding what's happening so being able to meet what's happening with that open-heartedness rather than being like oh i don't want that and so sometimes um you know we think that if i'm tough on myself then that's the way i'm going to move forward that if i bring compassion then i'm just going to just sort of be this like blob and i have actually found through my own practice that sometimes i do need to have that discipline but I need to have the capacity to do both like a rubber band, you know, sometimes to stretch and sometimes to relax. <laughs> okay. I did want to say that we eat dogs. So I apologize for using that expression, the dog eat dog world. So my apologies for putting that out there, but this idea is like a competitive society was the image that I was trying to get across. So my apologies if, if that was a little harsh to say that we live in this place that puts competition against our own self care. And Dan, we're gonna be moving into the part of how our self-care can bring us also into society. So now we're gonna focus looking at the self-compassion. And so the second aspect of Dr. Neff's focus is this sense of common humanity versus isolation. And so this is the sense of like when something goes wrong or something isn't working the way we wanted, which is not, we can't really say if it's wrong, but that we think it's my fault, that if I had only figured out the way to do it, then it wouldn't be happening. So for example, I have a, a couple beautiful titanium hips. And one of the responses that I find from people is like, oh, now why do you have that? And then there, I can see the mental checklist in their minds like, oh, I didn't go hiking. I didn't, you know, do that. I wasn't an athlete, you know, like, oh, phew, I'm not going to have, like as if there was some magic way to keep our body from aging. Like maybe you won't get titanium hips, but maybe there'll be something else that happens and it doesn't have to be because of this cause and condition. So what did I do wrong can be a response that actually has so many causes and conditions that it's not really useful for us to think about. And using this common sense of humanity can really break us from this isolation. And I think that right now, one of the things that has happened to us in this pandemic is that we really have moved to the sense of, of, of how we are all in this together. Even though when we look at it that way, we can still see that there are cultural conditions that cause more suffering to others. And then the third aspect that Kristen Neff um, brings in is this mi mindfulness versus over identification. So this one might not be as clear to some people. Over identification is when we have a problem, like we're like, Oh, I always do this. This is the way I do things. I'm all, whenever something happens, I just, you know, get angry or anxious or, or fretting and, and then we identify it. And then we become that instead of just having an anxious thought or a worrisome thought or a moment of uh, irritability, I become the angry person the anxious person, and then all of a sudden it becomes this whole personality. Whereas if I can think of it as a wave of emotions that's coming through and not just glom onto it, then it 
easier to care about that situation. And so we can be, begin to build this relationship to emotional landscape, the shifting emotional landscape of our lives, the relationship to our struggles. And as we build this emotional relationship to our emotional lives, we can better be there for others. And this is the relational aspect of compassion. And so in this pandemic, it has made us understand on such a level of the global being local and the local being global, that this way that we inter are with each other. Yes, the ocean says yes to the waves. Thank you. And so we have so many larger issues right now that I know my heart feels so resonant with so much and so tender with so many things that I see in society. You know, there's just tremendous need and economic insecurity. And then we have unemployment that's been continuing. And then the heart just feels this, can feel this great compassion, this great compassion. And we can relate to each other in that way. And with our mindfulness practice, we can actually deepen the sense of care so that we can remember that we are connected. In the language of the Buddha, Pali, the word for mind, citta, C-I-T-T-A, was actually, it's actually better translated as heart mind. So it's curious to me that in the translation, into English that we have landed on mindfulness and not mind heartfulness or even heartfulness. And I think that if we were to remember that our mind includes our heart, and in some cultures, when they point to the mind, they point here, that then our mindfulness practice will remember that we can't actually have a peaceful abiding when we're without being in coexistence with other people. And so this is where there's this titration of understanding ourselves and our own compassion, capacity for compassion. And so that's why I started this talk on this idea of self-compassion. And can I be there for my own mistakes? Can I remember that I'm going to fail and get up and start over again? So that when I see that happening on a greater scale, um, then I can learn how to cultivate it there. I really agree with you, Chris, the sense of numbness that can arise. And that's where I really think that we need to figure out how to nurture ourselves in these relationships. One of the things that is very front and center here in the United States, and it may be in your location as well, is really the um, seeing the legacies of racial injustice and really seeing how prominent they are and that need to have a heart that's open enough to meet that, not from a place of fear not from a place of like, oh, I'm, I, I can't handle this. And, and I go into sort of a disaggregation or, but from a place of care. There's a meditation teacher, author, um, Ruth King, many of you may know her. And she calls racism a heart disease. And I think that is just such a beautiful way to think about the compassionate element we need to address racism. It's a, she says, racism is a heart disease. And then she continues, how we think and respond is at the core of racial suffering and racial healing. If we cannot think clearly and respond wisely, we will continue to damage the world's heart. And so sometimes when we get to think about problems, we immediately go to this fixing and we, we lose our humanity, what the Dalai Lama was talking about earlier, the sense of the compassion being necessary for humanity. And just the same as like Ruth King thinking that racism is a heart disease, 
that we need to include how we respond. Are we responding with care and compassion? And if we can't, then maybe we just pause and develop that awareness and that until we can. And so this sense of kindness and compassion, as you're pointing to Dan here, includes all this way that we address all of the, the systemic problems in society so that we may forget Um, we may forget the underlying humanity of others at times. And to me, I think that's part of thinking of compassion as a journey, compassion as a process. And to quote um, human rights activist and leader, and many of you will know her, her husband as well, who's a great civil rights leader, Coretta Scott King, she says, struggle is a never ending process. Freedom is never really won. You earn it and win it in every generation. And I actually think this is true for us too, that you know sometimes we think these capacities of the heart are just something that we have, that either you get compassion or you get like the empty bucket. But I really, know from my own practice that this is something that we can grow, that we can grow this capacity to care, that we can really learn how to care for each other. There may be um, messages that we've got from our family or from society or from the culture of who is important to care for and who is not. And we can actually really learn to care, just like we can learn to care for those parts of ourselves that we may have been taught weren't as worthy. We can learn to care for our whole being. It's a never ending process. And there may be struggles in there. And so that's the commitment that we make over and over again. And so for right now, it might be a challenge for some of us to be compassionate and caring towards ourselves because we feel so isolated. And one of the things that I know in meditation is that people have said that Research has shown that just putting a hand on your own heart can evoke that sense of care towards yourself. And I remember a story about a young woman once who, who was in a situation as a child where she didn't feel the amount of caring that she wanted. And her story as an adult was how she would, in bed, just stroke her own cheek. And I felt so touched by that story of the ways that we learn to care for ourselves. And the thing about compassion is it actually doesn't matter what the other person is doing because compassion is the capacity of our own heart. And so it may be harder to feel compassion for somebody, but we could even just sort of, maybe we can feel compassion for that person before they open their mouth, when they're quiet. Like I can sometimes feel compassion for somebody when they're quiet. And then when they open their mouth, I'm like, oh, now I need to go to my own self-compassion because what I'm hearing is really hard. <laughs> so then I go to my own self-compassion. So it's a titration back and forth. It's not a giving over of all my compassion. It can be, as Jerry's saying here, this witnessing, a bearing witness to what is happening in the moment. And so our choice for our actions can be what we're doing. It can be compassionate to bear witness. And so it's not actually about the doing. Compassion includes a response, but it's not the in order to part. It's not the in order to. Compassion is that movement to respond. And then we do the best we can and then we go to our journey of compassion, knowing that maybe that didn't solve it. Maybe it helped. Maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I need to keep going. And so as we can develop our compassion at heart, we develop this sense of humanity, which more than like, what's in it for me? So when I go into a situation, I may be like, 
oh, that wasn't really what I needed, but I can see that for so many people in this group, that was exactly what they needed. And be like, oh, you know, okay, so that was for the group. It wasn't actually just for me. And so um, it is really hard sometimes, especially in different situations to feel that practice, which is where the invitation with so many of these practices is to start with someone who's easy to feel compassion for. So this is where you can, you know, start your garden and work on the soil. So maybe there's somebody who is easy for you to feel compassion for somebody who maybe is struggling a little bit in your life, and then you can just wish them well. You can care and feel that capacity of the heart. And for some of us, we could practice on ourselves, but for some of us, that will be hard as well. But you could just bring in part of your meditation. You could bring in some of the ways that we practice the inhale and compassion and then the letting go that we practice during the mindfulness. And I just want to finish. Yeah, so there, there is a whole, um, com there's a whole companion practices of, uh, in Buddhism that include compassion. So there's the, there's the four Brahma Viharas, the divine abodes, if you will, the loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. And I'm seeing some people bringing those up in the chat. So these are all heart practices that can be cultivated. Yeah, and so we all, you know, like I, I hear you about the, the challenge of developing compassion because it's not something that I had heard a lot about when I was a kid. There was a lot more I learned about being shamed and that sort of thing. So we'll do questions in a second. I'm almost finished here. I just want to finish with this one quote from another Buddhist teacher who I, I really admire. And she says, compassion is not a state. It is a way of engaging with the fragile and unpredictable world. Its domain is not only the world of those you love and care for, but equally the world of those who threaten us, disturb us, and cause us harm. It is the world of the countless beings we never meet who are facing an unendurable life. And then she continues, the ultimate journey of a human being is discover how much our heart can encompass. Our capacity to cause suffering, as well as to heal suffering, lives side by side within us. If we choose to develop the capacity to heal, which is the challenge of every human life, we will find our hearts can encompass a great deal and we can learn to heal rather than increase the schisms that divide us from one another. So I really appreciate this quote for a couple of reasons because she talks about this compassion being an ongoing process. This journey of quote, uh, I'll actually put this in the um, chat because it's a longer quote and I know it's harder to, to get that. Um, let me just put that in the chat for all of you um, here. This is, this is a uh, Christina Feldman who is a Buddhist teacher from Britain. And so she talks about our capacity to develop compassion can really help us be with these differences that we encounter, encounter in the world that can cause schism. And so if we can choose to develop this capacity, we can really lean into the sense of that sometimes we too make mistakes and we can see the imperfections in our societies as well. So, the ultimate journey of being human, she says, is to meet our hearts and to develop the capacity of our hearts, knowing that we each have this capacity for healing and that we can include this practice compassion on our journeys to be with, to turn towards the suffering and to meet and transform and to heal both ourselves and our communities. So thank you so much for your kind attention tonight. And um, there's lots of things that were happening in the chat. And I know a couple of people raised their hands and I don't know if it was inadvertent, but um, people are welcome to put questions or comments as you have been doing in the chat. We can also um, have an opportunity probably for a couple of people who wanna use the raise your hand self in the reaction so that we can get, if anybody wants to participate that way. 
Um, oh, there's a dog I was mentioning earlier. I have a, I have a eight month old dog here. So the dog is learning to practice mindfulness <laughs> during my meditation period. So yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm really like uh, seeing some people mention this process of how compassion and self-compassion can support each other. I really feel that personally that I really needed to start with practicing compassion for myself before I could really feel it for others because I would get so overwhelmed with the we know suffering that then I wasn't available to be there with others. And as I began to practice in a real formal way, as I did with the meditation, then I was able to increase the capacity of my heart. Um, so there has been a lot of writings about the difference between compassion, uh, compassion and empathy. And um, I'm not going to kind of get into the nuances of that. I think they're both beautiful capacities of the heart. Some people say compassion brings about empathy. Some people say empathy brings about compassion. So um, they're both these capacities of relational capacities of the heart that allow us to feel our, um, our interconnectedness. Let me see. I think there was a couple other questions in here. Oh, so there's a question here about the challenge. Oh, uh, like watching, for example, some of the things on the like for today, it says watching the impeachment trial, seeing violence, how to hold compassion there, that I'm not there. You know, that's where I think the direction of compassion can flow back and forth. Like when we experience fear, especially if there's a violence there, to acknowledge that fear and then to offer compassion for ourselves is really important because the compassion to offer the self-care will know, then we can remind us that perhaps there's something that happened in, in someone else's life that causes them to act in that way. And that doesn't mean we want to allow or permit. There's still an accountability piece for people's actions, but it's how do we maintain that connection to each other. Um, oh, and someone else is mentioning this, the phrase of like putting on your own um, oxygen mask first, right, right, so that we need to take, you know, kind of be with ourselves here in order to support others. Is there anybody who wanted to um, ask a question, somebody who um, we can unmute and you could share in the group if that feels um, appropriate, something that you're feeling you want to share? Chris, I see you have your hand raised. You want to unmute and share? Oops, you're still muted. There we go. Thanks, JD, for the talk. It's great. It's really timely. Um, I'm on the other side of the world, and uh, you know what I saw in the news, uh, especially in the first day of the sitting of the trial, is uh, pertinent to everyone all over the world. I think. Um, so, yeah, I think we're all actually going through a bit of shock and suffering revisiting that stuff, and the, the talk is very timely for that. So my question to you is um, this business of self-compassion, um, it's a great idea, and I actually teach self-compassion, uh, but um, one of the things that was made known to me or made known to me uh, in my studies and talking to other people about it is that sometimes we actually don't even have a template for loving. Uh, and if you have a look at, you know, at, at, at uh, early childhood development, you have to be loved first before you can love, even yourself. So what happens if your emotional bank balance is absolutely dry and you? it's not like, oh, I, I remember being loved a long time ago and I haven't really received any love for 20 years or 30 years, but there is some memory of it as opposed to, I haven't got a clue what she's talking about. <laughs> what the hell is this? Is that... Is that what Martians do or what? You know, what's this love business? What's this being care? What the hell are they talking about? Can you say something about how to go from nothing to something in this regard, please? 
Oh, thank you, Chris. Well, part of what I was suggesting with this idea of this being a journey is that, you know, like a garden, you know, like you're going to plant the seeds, you're watering the seeds, you're tending the seeds that, um, you know, I'm not Mother Teresa. And I remember at one point really being, uh, I, I grew, up, grew up Catholic. So if I, that my, my Mother Teresa um, mm -hmm. reference and uh, I read that she prayed and met, you know, meditated four hours a day. And I know she did a lot more than that, but that, that made me feel really good. Cause I knew at least, you know, she was work had to do every day to meet what she was doing at that level. She still had to work four or five hours a day in silence, praying to be able to serve four or five hours a day. So it's not like you reach some plateau and then all of a sudden you're, you know, wholly and able to, to, um, be there. So this is the journey. This is the journey of cultivating compassion, just like a garden. And just like a garden, there may be times that we have more fallow times, you know, or that we're more inward. Um, and so as somebody who did not ever really resonate when I was younger with this idea of, you know, self-love, that I did a lot of the practices of meditation where you offer yourself kindness, you offer yourself, may I be happy, may I feel, you know, caring. And I didn't really have much resonance, but the teachers who I worked with said, just keep practicing, just keep practicing. And, you know, the thing was like, I had no problem doing all those other things of like, oh, you're not good enough. You're, you know, you can't do this. You know, you shouldn't be doing that. And they had a lot of resonance, but I would feel like, how, why should I say, oh, you know, may you be happy when I, and I was like, so I was like, it's, there's a practice there because at some point, you know, it begins to sink in and, and you know, and as another teacher said, um, you know, it's like when they did something, it was like at one point when they realized their, their kindness practice, which was like, they were like, oh, you know, you so-and-so, but I love you, you know? So you begin to have those little <laughs> steps where you're like, you know, like, oh, you know, really? Oh, but I, you know, love you too. So it's just, you have these steps and then you have to just keep believing that it's possible that we are all deserving of love. We're all deserving of kindness. And that is a journey. Okay, fake it till you make it. <laughs> there you go. That I, I, I'm right there with you, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you very much. <laughs> and then, um, Debbie, do you want to um, share? Hi. Um, so I think self-compassion, I think if there was, I guess it's a question, kind of like a generalized statement maybe that you can help me with. So self-compassion, I think, is something that, for me, I just want to keep doing for, like, the remainder of my life because I think that in our society, I think we lack the ability. Because I, I almost think that when you start to give yourself self-compassion, which I'm doing now, um, sometimes others can think of it as being selfish. Um which I don't believe because getting back and kind of piggybacking on what the gentleman who just spoke said is that I've had to do a lot of work on myself to love the little Debbie and to take care of her. And she was really wounded because of the way I grew up. Not that my parents were bad people. They were very good people. I just had so much anxiety and so much fear as a little girl and then I had, you know, some trauma that went on and, and you know, yada, yada, yada. And so I've really had to do a lot of work on taking care of that little Debbie and incorporating her inside of me so that we could be whole. And then yep. I've had yep. to um, work on every day I wake up and I look at myself in the mirror and I say, um, you are wanted you are needed and you are loved and I love you. And it's not an easy thing to do, but if you practice it every day and that's what I do every day. And then I also embrace every emotion that I have. And this is just because I've, you know, I, I, I have, um, you know, addiction runs in my family and I'm a recovering alcoholic and, 
you know, I've done a lot of work on myself and a lot of meditation and it's really, really, and I suffer from OCD perfectionism. So I'm the worst offender of beating myself up. So I don't need anyone to do that. And so to show self-love for myself is like a huge task. And mm-hmm. every day mm-hmm. I work so hard at positive yeah. talk. It's so powerful in writing. I journal. Like yeah. I might write a poem about my emotions. Right Thank you. I so appreciate what you're saying, just this ongoing. And some days you might feel it and it really resonates and other days not. And then, and as you're saying, Debbie, just a way of having tools, like sometimes it's a poem, some days it's affirmations, some days that's everyone, other people are appreciating your dog too, who give us that love, you know, and there's different ways that we get those affirmations to meet some of the experiences that we had in our, especially in our early childhood that are really, really challenging. So thank you for that share. Thank you for your vulnerability. Um, Elaine, and I think this will be the last one. Um, thank you. Thank. Can Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. That was lovely. I, this is not so much a question as a comment, but several years ago, I took part in, in a, a mindfulness um, class and they were sort of developing the class and one of the developers um, was Tupton Jinpa, uh, the Dalai, one of the Dalai Lama translators. So um, what was very interesting is what they told us is that they had their module set and they wanted to start out with self-compassion and from self-compassion, you know, go to a loved one, you know, and, and then, you know, you gradually go to somebody who you're not particularly happy with or you're uncomfortable with. And they, they tested this, this protocol out in many, many places, and they found particularly in the United States, it didn't work. And it didn't work because people couldn't do, for the most part, self-compassion. And so they, they switched it. And so you started practicing by choosing someone or, or a pet or even a plant that you naturally felt um, compassionate feelings toward. And you would feel that, which came up pretty easily. You know, if you have a pet, mm-hmm. uh, it's, it's sort of like a pretty clean compassion. It's, it's yeah, yeah. love one people. So it gets muddy a little bit. Right. Uh, so you get to feel what that's like, you know, oh, you know, my, my little puppy. Um, right. It's very clear and it's not complicated. And then you that's sort of so replace cool. that puppy you know, in, in your mind and in your practice with, with someone that you feel pretty good about most of the time, you know, and, and, um, and somewhere along the way, then you do practice self-compassion because you've learned a little bit about what that means to feel that. Mm-hmm. And so, mm-hmm. you, you know, you, you, it was very difficult to put your, you know, to start out putting yourself first because a lot of people don't know what that feels like. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just thought that was a very interesting um, thing that they found out that, you know, they thought, oh, well, of course, everybody, you know, start with yourself, but it didn't work. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. It's definitely, there's definitely a cultural aspect of that as well, when you're talking about the United States and the way our culture is oriented and uh, different ways. And so that's part of the reason why I brought it up tonight, because we don't often think about practicing self-compassion in an ongoing way. So And there's also just been a lot of research around how beneficial it is for our resilience and for our communities and to support us in our capacities to heal. So we have reached the end of our evening tonight. And some of you are, if you're interested, you can stay after and we can go into breakout rooms. But um, I also want to wrap up this section and Tom will help um, those people who would like to stay and explain that in a minute. But I just want to pause and kind of come back into our bodies for a few minutes from all of our talking and and um, do we offer one of the practices that I encourage us to do is dedicate the merit. And that's this practice where we can remember how connected we are to each other and share the benefit with everyone. So let's just pause and, and um, um, be with our selves for a moment, feeling into our bodies and this intentions for care and kindness that brought us here tonight. 
and letting go of whatever wasn't beneficial and whatever you needed tonight that might be supportive, allowing it to sink in. Allowing any kindness towards yourself to be present, even if it's just the smallest intention for care. And then like a pebble in a pond, allowing any aspect of goodness or kindness to ripple out in all directions and to benefit all beings everywhere. Wishing all beings everywhere to be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings everywhere know peace.